Greetings everyone, and welcome back to Pep Organ. Well, I hope you're as excited as I am for 2023. We've got some wonderful things planned for the channel, and I hope that you have some great things planned for your life too. Well, if you're like me, uh, at the start of every year, you start to get a little bit reflective about previous years, and perhaps you also plan some New Year's resolutions. Well, I've got a resolution that I'm giving to all of you as a challenge, and that is in the form of five classical music traditions that I think need to make a comeback. I've prepared this list after thinking a bit about the state of music today and where we could see some improvement and look back into the past to try and inform us and guide us for what we can be doing in the future to create a better musical atmosphere and scene for everyone. So the first thing I've thought of is tonal composition. This is basically a must for me and it's something that many of you on the channel also already appreciate, but let me just tell you what I mean. Uh, composition has been generally tonal for centuries now, starting back with early harmonies in the Renaissance. But what happened is that as harmonies got more and more complex uh, and the expressive means grew more and more through the orchestra and through instruments, what we saw is that the actual uh, complexity became too much and it got to the point where the purpose of this, which was to improve expression, actually started to do the opposite and just created more confusion. Tonal composition is uh, my plea for us to return back to harmonic principles of the common practice era from about the 16th to 19th centuries and use that not just to go back in time, but to use that for the expressive capability that you can still get from this style of composition. I'm just going to play for you a short musical excerpt just using some basic harmonies just to show you what I mean by this. Just using the simplest of harmonies, you can create an immediate kind of mood that you can't create with all the sorts of uh, dissonant atonal sounds. Here's something else you could do just with a few basic harmonies. Again, very few harmonies employed there, but enough just to create a mood and something that I'm sure many of you could already feel has some kind of emotional meaning. Now, if you're wondering what I just played just then, it was in fact an improvisation that I just made up. And that brings me to the second tradition that I'd like to talk about today. Improvisation is something that many people in the classical world used to practice on a regular basis, uh, as part of their professions in fact. It's still a minor part of the organist's job, but mostly when we think about improvisation in music today, we often think about jazz. But I'd like to change this and challenge you to start improvising as well. The beauty of improvisation is that there really is no such idea as a perfect improvisation. Everything has to be a little bit more messy and it's going to be more experimental. When you improvise, you're creating something fresh and new that no one has ever heard before. So there's so much room for potential and for you to express your personal idea of music. Now, for many of you, I know that the word improvisation strikes up so much fear because you're so used to reading music and the idea of just making something up on the spot is terrifying. Well, I have to tell you something. I didn't start improvising by listening to classical music and playing classical music and studying formally. No, I actually started improvising by listening to my favorite pop songs and just looking at chord charts and learning what kind of chords they use. The fascinating thing about this is that if you listen to pop songs, you might just find that they use three or four basic chords, such as one, four, and five. And this is an excellent place, if you don't know anything about improvisation, to start learning how to do it. Put down a few chords, one, four, and five, and then you can start creating a piece of music of your own. And from there, anything is possible. So improvisation is the next idea, and I encourage you to use it to your advantage, put it into your recitals, and start playing around with it a little bit more. Now, of course, the purpose of improvisation is so that you can express yourself and have more uh, free choice within what you do. And of course, that brings me to my next point, which is expressive freedom or what also may be called textual liberty. You see, in the past, people didn't used to view scores by Bach and Mozart with the reverence that they do in the past hundred years or so, ever since classical music got this sort of formal attitude to it. In fact, uh, people would treat pieces of music, the scores, more like a script. See, think of the way we talk about Shakespeare as being a script. We read the words, but the rest is up to the actor to bring to life that script. 
and in a similar way, I think scores should be treated no more than a script. You see, they cannot communicate the full expression that is required to create a beautiful performance. They're only the notes, and sometimes a little bit more, some dynamics and expression marks, but the rest of it is up to you. And the best way to add expression into a piece of music is to study the harmony that I've just talked about. If you pay attention to the harmony and the dissonances and the consonances, you can really create something special. Let me give you a musical example now to tell you what I mean. I'm going to play for you a piece of music that many of you who play piano would be already familiar with. It's Bach's Prelude in C minor, though not the one from the Well-Tempered Clavier. Here's how it goes. Now, what I played for you just then was essentially what was on the page. It's the piece of music and nothing more. But uh, if Bach heard that, he'd probably be appalled because people in the old days, or before the modern era, would not have played music as it was written on the score, but would have used the expressive knowledge that they already had ingrained into them by their teachers and by the, the era. Let me now give you an example of how I might play this piece of music using some of the harmonies to create more of an expressive effect. So that's an example of how you might use some of the harmonies to express a piece of music like this one by Bach. Now if you didn't like that second performance of Bach, that's quite alright. Um, we all have our different perspectives on music, and it's perfectly alright for you to have a totally different idea of how music should be played. And this brings me to my fourth point of a musical tradition we should bring back, and that is the role of the audience. You see, one of the worst things that happened in the late 19th century and the early 20th century was the formalization of the audience experience of classical music. You see, in the past, if the audience really enjoyed a piece of music, they would express themselves very clearly and very adamantly, and if they didn't enjoy it, well, they wouldn't give quite a positive impression. One example is when Beethoven was to premiere some of his symphonies, if a movement was particularly beautiful, um, the audience would cheer and applaud between movements. Can you imagine how horrifying it would be if someone were to applaud between movements today? But back then, it was very commonplace. I think it was the Seventh Symphony, the second movement, the audience applauded that, and they demanded an immediate encore. You see, back then, it, they didn't think of a symphony as something that you have to listen to just from start to finish, with the movements being sat down with uh, complete silence and no applause. If you really enjoyed a movement, you expressed it, and I love that. I think that the audience should have a, a place to express themselves and how much they enjoyed a concert and enjoyed a particular movement in, in particular. Because then we can start to gauge what people actually like and what they don't like. On the other hand, uh, if you don't really like a piece of music or if the, the whole audience doesn't enjoy something, well, you're very welcome to walk out. Uh, no one's obliging you to stay in your seat. I know that this might sound a bit harsh, but let's talk more about uh, music in other contexts. You know, whether it's uh, um, popular concerts, uh, pop concerts, People do clearly express themselves with cheers and screams if they enjoy music, and if they hate it, well, they don't give quite a happy reaction. They may boo, or they may walk out, or whatever. It's a more harsh world out there, and for some reason, the classical music world has shielded itself from all of this um, expression from the audience. And the problem with that is that people get away with atrocious performances of good music and play really bad music as well that no one is enjoying and we're just obliged at the end to applaud. I would encourage you that if you enjoy something, show that you enjoy it, and if you don't enjoy it, well, show that you don't, or just keep it to yourself, or even better, tell your friends and be honest. Say, I didn't enjoy that, and then we can start to have a dialogue about what we like and what we don't like. And my last tradition that I think really needs a comeback is another one that applies to all of you. 
because that is singing. And that might sound strange to you at first because we're surrounded by singers uh, all over the place. Uh, the top charts of pop music is all singing. And of course, everyone attends opera to hear the human voice. So why do I think singing needs a comeback? Well, in my perspective, what I think has happened is that singing has become far too professionalized and it sort of excluded the majority of people from even attempting to sing. If you look at my generation, for instance, the only people who are willing to sing in public are those who have had some training or who are confident. Um, most people don't have the confidence anymore to sing in public. There was a really interesting example of this in my personal life. You see, I went to a college and university and the college had a song. Uh, it's a tradition for many colleges to have their college song, you see. And what was really interesting is that it was an alumni dinner, so we had people from the college who had been there 50 years ago all the way up to today. And when this, we started to sing the college song, the people who were growing up in the 1970s sang it with a, with a tune, you see, and we sang it just like as a chant, and we just completely shout and scream it. And what shocked me is that we didn't even know that it had a tune. We didn't realize that back in the past, this college song actually was a song with a melody. And uh, this just goes to show how over time, uh, the, the music and the general singing culture of our society has really collapsed and degraded itself. These were men, by the way, in the 1970s who were into rugby and sports, and it was much more uh, masculine, feminine culture back then. And nonetheless, despite all of that, these men were very willing to stand up and sing a song together on occasion. So what has happened to singing is that it's lost its cultural place for some reason, and I think that's really sad. On another sad note, another tradition that is starting to fade away is of mothers singing to their children when they're young. Now I know that many mothers still do sing to their children, and fathers too, but on the whole, this tradition has started to decline, and one of the reasons for it is that it's so easy now, especially if you're lazy, to just go onto YouTube and play a nursery rhyme. You know that some of the most popular videos on YouTube are in fact children's songs, and it's probably because the parents just put this music on for their kids and they don't sing anymore. And I think that's really, really sad, because this whole idea of public singing and singing just as a pastime and as a hobby and a leisure activity is being lost because we're just being fed music all the time and we're never giving it back. And I think that that really needs to change. So singing as a whole, I don't know how we're going to do this, but I think that on the whole, just pay attention in your personal life. How often do people actually sing just for fun? Uh, how often do they just want to sing a song and not be judged? And if you're the one judging people just because they have a not a perfect singing voice, then have a think about where, what the role of music really is and whether we should be putting people down just because they're not professionals. Just a thought. Anyway, those are my five classical music traditions that I think need a comeback. Is it gonna come this year or will we have to wait longer? I don't know, but we can all make a change and we can all try and contribute something of our talents and our abilities and try and learn something new to this year. So I encourage you to do that. Thanks for watching and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.